Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Artist Alchemy. I'm David Reed. I'm with the Yuba Center Arts and Culture Council, and we're very pleased to welcome our guest this week, Mr. Stuart Gilchrist. Hi, it's good to be here, David. Thank you. And, and if I may, just a, just a step back for a moment, uh, you know, looking at our kind of introductory statement, um, you know, what the heck is, uh, is alchemy anyway? It's, it's this kind of medieval pseudoscience where the term came from, but it's, you know, in this context, it's, we like to look at it as the, the power or the process that changes or transforms something in a mysterious or impressive way. So I think part of today's discussion will be about transformation. Isn't that what artists do and designers and visionaries? So Stuart, to kick things off a little bit, I have to ask, so what's a dazzling urbanite like you doing in a rustic setting like this? <laughs> oh, I had enough of the glamorous sea life. I decided to settle down in Marysville, California, my hometown. Um, you're, you're a native son of Marysville, right? I am. I was born and raised here. And uh, in fact, you know, it was funny. I was coming up for a weekend vacation, a little weekend visit, and my car broke down and I never left. When was really? this? Oh, give me the time frame. Uh, August of 2018. Okay, so just yeah. two years ago, literally this next yeah. month. Two years ago, I took a leave of absence from work to complete some eye surgery I was going through. And I decided to drive up to Marysville to visit friends. And of course I have property up here as well in the, in the foothills. Right. And my car broke down and I never left. I'm Where not were you living at the time? Were you down south? Were you in LA or? San Francisco. So you were in San, okay, you were in San Francisco at that I point. I in San Francisco, um, and I w worked in Menlo Park uh, for two years. I was commuting back and forth from San Francisco right. to Menlo Park. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. So you're a you're a designer, an artist, a business owner, architectural historian, uh, urban planner, an entrepreneur, and, and a true visionary of you know how things might be. Did I, did I cover up them all, Stuart? Mm -hmm. I feel like I may have left something out. You forgot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you forgot. I haven't farmed in a long time. But yeah, yeah. yeah agriculture or any, any sort of landscape design, any any opportunity to get into the dirt and, and, and make things grow and plant and, you know, create a legacy of some kind. Um, oh, I love it. I love it. I know you're. I know you're keeping busy. How? I mean, in general, how are you holding up during these crazy, turbulent times? So, with COVID nineteen, it hit at the craziest time, and I took the first two weeks and, like everyone, went into complete solitude. And I ran out of Netflix. I got to tell you, and I was ready to attack the world. And luckily, you know, the city of Marysville had gotten me involved with um, a project with Michelle Reeves. Um, um, uh, she's a consultant through SACOG, and we had started a program in October for the city of Marysville, the Downtown Merchants, the Downtown Turnaround Program. And that morphed into COVID-19 and how to run a business, brick and mortar, and I jumped into that, um, along with getting my own business ready and helping other locals and, and it just being just being a local resident and a merchant and things like that. I jumped into um, studying how to respond as far as design is concerned. Um, I can go on. I belong to a, um, a group of designers and some of them are Italian from Italy and actually came up with amazing solutions for design once they were able to go back into business. And this was happening in tandem you know, with all people shutting down, it, Italy shut down before the United States did. And right. you try and start designing. You, you're not going to, you know. And some of the coolest and the simplest designs came up. People putting shower curtains up to separate tables, even. Right. I've yeah. heard about that. Yeah. 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 So, you know, when you're through with Netflix, you start going on to all of your, your, your association hosts on Facebook and you learn the greatest things. How are people responding? in the most positive way, as artists and designers and architects. So yeah. that's what I did. I know you've kept busy and I know we've been talking um, throughout the whole pandemic process. So, and you're involved in so many different things. Um, we've known each other for several years, a couple of years you've been here now and I've enjoyed our, our conversations as well as a couple of project collaborations we'll talk about later in the program. But, but if you don't mind, can you just roll us through the basics about your origin story? I know you started in Marysville. 
I did. And you, you love this place. And But what was your first big move away? What was your first adventure out into the world beyond Marysville? My first big real adventure was the move to San Francisco in 1980. Okay. And I, I moved to San Francisco to attend Western Design Institute. And it was a training oh. school that I found um, after reading a book my father gave me in 1978 called Interior Views by Eric oh. Brown. Wow. And of course, this changed my life. And that's I was going to say, is it one of those life-changing moments? Yeah, or books, I mean, or? Winters High School couldn't do this. Yuba College couldn't do this. And, yeah. some, and my mom, of course, being you know Barbara Smith Cummings, every specialist in the world, what are we going to do for Stuart here? I'm like, mm, there is nothing here for him, design school. So in 1980, I, I did it, and um, wow. did it, and uh, and by 1984, you know, I had come back to Marysville for the summer, and I was involved in Yuba College Theater with David Wheeler. That's how I got to know Wakina Calvo Johnson. Well, you did theater too. I I missed that step. Oh, oh right. you got the theater yeah. background too. <laughs> and so I, um, you know, for the summer of '83. I uh, a break from school in San Francisco, came back to Marysville again and completely immersed myself in the arts in, in, in Yuba College Theater. And I also worked for a young designer by the name of Marty Fry. And she um, had an office in Marysville um, in Anita Delaney's uh, building and it was called Design Source. And I worked for her for a while. But then I moved back to San Francisco to pack up and I got a job in New York with Bloomingdale's interior design department. So shall we go in that direction? <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. No, take us there because I forgot about the New York step. So, so there, was a, wow. yeah, there was a recession in California and we knew there would be. Um, Mom always said, be prepared. And um, so there was no work in California and no one was hiring. So my friend put me on a plane and I went out to New York and I got a job in, it, it, with the interior design department at Bloomingdale's, wow. which was the support department for the furniture department. We didn't do displays. We were hired to go into people's homes and furnish them. Here's a 20, you know, here's this kid given this responsibility yeah. to furnish people's homes. And That's that right there is what got me the job. Oh. Job drawing, the ability to produce something that doesn't exist in great detail, captured the attention of Richard Napple, who was the director of design. And then I went from DC to, uh, from, from New York to Washington, DC, where I uh, transferred um, and worked for the design department there. Uh, oh, so for Bloomingdale's? Bloomingdale's interior design department in Tyson's Corner and Oh White my God, I, I worked in Tyson's for several right. years. I so still that, live in, in Maryland, but I'd commute to Tyson. So I knew we'd overlapped yeah. somewhere in there. So that's wild. And I you were at Tyson's about when? I accepted the job because of the Philip Johnson Tower, the one that was yeah. Wow, yeah. this is new in 40. You know, I'm like, oh, this could be cool. Wow. Well, skyscraper was the Philip Johnson one, which stuck out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's grown up quite a bit. Um, yeah. Um, but that took me immediately to a wonderful firm in Georgetown called Anthony Child's Interiors, oh. Anthony Child's Inc. And that taught me continental design and, and European design and English decoration, most definitely, and how to use upholstery and proper antiques and decorations. Because in Washington, D.C., people use them. We've got such an international clientele yeah. there, and, and I'm assuming very upscale, right? Very much, yeah. And these were heirloom pieces, really, or you know, acquisitions at auction secretly. And it's a completely different world out there. Was the emphasis uh, on the design as opposed to selling a bunch of hardware, or, or yeah, yeah, you, 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 you well, you, you, if you do someone's home, um, you know, you furnish it and you yeah. sell pieces for them that are the right scale and value and what have you. Nice. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, how fun. Yeah. A lot that goes into interior design and architecture. A lot, a lot of personality. You have to really get to know your clients. How'd you um, like Washington D.C.? I love it. I love Washington D.C. I was concerned about the humidity, and the other phenomenon is when it snows, it's like a drizzle, and the entire yeah. thing shuts down. And I'm like, um, I'm from ta I like hello, twelve feet. Maybe we'll slow down. We're Californians, and yeah. the response was well. Then why don't you go back to California? <laughs> why are you here? <laughs> anyway, 
it's, it is. It, it's pretty gentle, but yeah, it is humid. And I, I found yeah. after 20 years, I kind of got used to it. But yeah. it's, it is what it is. You're going to stop living, you know. It's just you go out, do what you do, and you take an extra shower or whatever. But I have to admit, California called, and I came up running. And I went yeah. right to Hollywood. And, um, and that was an amazing experience. And that was in 1988. So uh. I returned to California in 1988. So from 85 to 88, I absorbed the East Coast and I um, was hired by a Hollywood producer to do his home within two months of returning, moving to California. And my career was launched from that point on. Wow. Very exciting. Um, yeah, that's just when I was leaving to go to D.C. So I missed you there. But. Yeah, we were like right. we were planes. No, yeah, I yeah. You were in a plane. I was driving. So here we are in Hollywood, where I worked for many years and hang out in West Hollywood. And wow, was it like cool? Yes. So at that time, you were you were the green building was completed with the Pacific Design Center. It's a PDC, baby. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Right. And now the red building is completed. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't either. You know, and I can't wait to see it. Uh, a friend of mine is a council member in the city of West Hollywood. Hi, John and Nico. Um, but. Um, I never got to see the red building, but my furniture collection was in the green building at Mimi London, Inc. Wow. That was exciting to be able to produce a collection of furniture named after my family. Um, and it was really? Like, oh, yeah. I, I, still, I still have a few of the pieces here for people to see. Um, and I did that in 1990, 91. Um, and, and so, and basically, I had designed furniture for my client. And the showroom owner who I had purchased the items from to make this um, piece said, you know, I, you know, I'd love to see what you come up with and kind of sarcastically. And I love that. And I came back with the furniture and I was offered the, the, the opportunity to create a line of furniture. Well, and how was it? I mean, you obviously at that point had experience in multiple cities and a, a pretty amazing resume, I'm assuming. Well, how, you're still young. I mean, how was it in that world? Uh, is it is it still an uphill battle? If you can draw something, you have the job. Really? If you can, and you can write a purchase order, and then you can do a workroom order, and you can complete a completed project at the with the accolades of the finest workroom. You'll always be employed. Interesting. So really, not an ageism, if you will, issue. No, I mean, actually, in fact, when I was younger, I got a lot of sarcasm because they were like, "Oh yeah, what do you know?" But you have to understand, my family exposed me to design and architecture when I was born. And, and my, 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 and my in-laws are all engineers of almost every you know, major infrastructure project in the state of California. Yeah. And I take that for granted. Um, the big ones, my uncles and grandfather, they are all engineers who did massive projects. And I used to hear about everything, including Orville Down. Wow. And it. And so I'm just very lucky to have come from a family that was extremely nurturing and supportive. And I knew with precision focus exactly what I was going to do. And that's all I've done. And you were, I think, soaking it all up because I think you're by nature, you're a pretty curious, inquisitive guy. You're just gobbling up all that. Not right. I mean, it's just yeah. Yeah. every day is a new learning yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, and, and I touched everything as a kid. If anyone can re remember, Marysville had a Putnam's store. It was a tabletop store. And we what was that? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I don't know Putnam's. It was a Putnam's, and it was a beautiful Putnam's. store. It was in a transformed gas station on uh, 5th and D, and it was during the modernist period. Um, and it had beautiful tabletop, and there were a lot of beautiful things for me to go in and touch. And my mother would say, if you touch any of it, and, and then my dad would say, ah, ah let him touch them. And the ladies with horror on their faces would let my dad, would let me touch everything. Um, Are these new products or resale or? or? Tabletop is a term used for dishes, crystal, silver, china. Okay. So pattern, and I'm not sure what Putman's had, but Gump's had like Prefica and Buchel, all of the different companies okay. that make beautiful dishes. Yeah. And brides go in and register for them and you okay. get dishes for, for wedding gifts and silverware and napkins and yeah. Yeah. what a fondue <laughs> fondue any, any sporks how about yeah. sporks? sport no 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 spark is in the sports section which you would go to randolph's for seafood what about seafood forks There's seafood shellfish forks yes like the yeah. fish fork and the knife fork 
No, that really people purchase those things here um, at, at right. Puppies. And I, that was my favorite place to go and terrorize the ladies. Yeah. They knew, oh God, here he comes. We're gonna have to clean all of <laughs> my dad. My dad let me do it, and because we purchased some, you know, they couldn't. <laughs> they couldn't <laughs> <see him. laughs> Couldn't mess with him, right? A small terrorist in town. That you know what that, that kid's family equals in annual sales in this store? <laughs> I mean, let's, let's, let's get real here. Well, so as, a, as a, I went to work at Gumps in San Francisco, and I recognized the young kids that wanted to know quality. And, they would, and you would just let them. And then there were the other terrorists. But usually their parents had them handled by the time they got to the second floor at Gumps. <laughs> I, I recognize genius in little kids, and you just watch them, and they want to know how was this made, and you you need to give them answers, and it's phenomenal, you know, teaching. I love it. Well, you kind of you kind of covered some of my my next questions, and <laughs> as far as you being you know creative and and obviously very interested as a as a child, which you were, and you you touched on one of your earlier artistic inspirations, the, uh, the book you showed, anything else that just really fired your imagination as a, as a kid in terms of uh, creativity? So I knew there were two important people in, in a family's life, my family's, they were the two important people that my parents listened to, no one else. My parents listened to nobody. It was the architect and the designer, uh, Lloyd Martin and Sue Gilpatrick. Those two got my parents' respect, and I figured that's interesting, I want that job. <laughs> so, um, right, and and for good reason. And you couldn't pick a better architect or a better designer to learn from. And through my years, what was the question? I forget what the question was. Any, going any other artistic inspirations? Oh, um, every good designer yeah. that I have found and gone to work for or studied, they have taught me so much. Um, and the last... I'm still learning. Like I have had the honor of working with Mark English, who is an amazing architect in San Francisco. Faro Esselot, who's far too busy to ever be on Facebook, is so cool. And then, you know, so many amazing designers. And my last boss was Jane Antonacci. And, you know, as her last senior designer, the work she put me through and the training I got from this lady was the most comprehensive contract mm. on the planet. The designers that know how to turn their biz alchemy, turn their craft into a strong business, that's my inspiration. Yeah. Um, and, and to see a completed product from a sketch is phenomenal. And anyone who can do that and inspire me, that's my inspiration. Incredible. Architects the same, plazas, park, landscape designers, urban planners, Michelle Reeves. Um, with SACOG and how she can transform a retail store with no money and her team is phenomenal. And very few people can do that. And there's a fine line between thrown together and craft. Well, you're right. We watched that last year in the phase one of, that was the uh, SACOG funded project. That, yes. That kind was of a retail makeover and, and Michelle from Portland, I think, right? So that's where her firm is from. Yeah. So, Sevillas, yeah. Sevillas. Sevillas, yeah. Yeah, Sevillas. wonderful group. I was part of that first part, just kind of listening yeah. in. And just so supportive and amazing uh, program for the merchants in, uh, in Marysville to learn from. And consider it. She has two retail specialists from completely diverse backgrounds. Yeah. One of them works for Ikea. And that's right. a retail. Ikea transformed how the United States does business, as did mm -hmm. Amazon. And so these people are on the cutting edge. And learning exactly how to how to keep this retail scenario going, and those are the people that I'm going to listen to. Well, and they are in Marysville, you know, brought to Marysville through that grant. That yeah. it's just like what an opportunity! An amazing for opportunity. Those, those so students on D Street absorbed all of that. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So other designers that inspired me would be Ron Mann and Michael Taylor and Francis Elkins, and all of these names will not mean anything to you, but they were true California designers. Yeah, I've got their books, which was kind yeah. of a yeah, yeah. friend of mine, Stephen Salney. Hey, you got and, a hell of a library there. I know. Huge library, and then the brother David Adler, Why? <laughs> and then Michael Taylor's work. Oh, and beautiful! All beautiful. Of these are telling stories of not only the client and the personality between the designer, architect, and the client, but the fine art and all of the history that goes behind all of that. And so you're not just slapping together a few things. You're actually putting together 
the place where, um, where you know, business is done. Well, and I love that where you have that melding of art and it, and it goes through the, this process, this design process, and, yeah. and it re-manifests itself as far as, you know, real quality of life issues, whether it's a personal living space or a, a business space or an entire community. Yeah. Um, to, to be mindful of, yeah. uh, of good design and good practice while preserving, you know, the, uh, the integrity of the community, the history, but still uh, putting a whole new uh, surface on it, if you will, and giving it a refresh, I guess, without corrupting anything that's happened in the past that's a value. Yeah. Fresh is key. You, you, have to, you have to reinvent constantly. You know, Rome is a perfect example. Um, they just keep building on top of each other. With new stuff. It's fascinating. All right. So you're, Rome. <laughs> it's not a very good example. Well, it really is, actually. Not, no, probably. <laughs> appropriate, I think. So you're off in uh, San Francisco and New York and DC yeah. and San Francisco and now in LA and Hollywood and mm -hmm. all those wonderful places, uh, that big city background. So here you are, Marysville 2.0, the last two years. Mm -hmm. uh, you're back to where it all began. You, you kind of told us you came, came for a visit and Never went, went, never went back. Yeah. Um, do you have? I mean, what's the deal? Do you have some kind of savior complex, or, you know, I, he said affectionately. Uh, I is is so is Marysville this epic canvas for you of sorts? Is it so I'll tell you, I take it for granted. Everywhere, everywhere I've lived has been phenomenal and beautiful and well maintained. Everywhere, and I came back to my hometown, and I have to tell you, I was shocked and appalled and gr deeply depressed, and it, you know, and and I, I, I felt and I just felt the need to do something, and luckily, I at the same time I met Kelvin Scruggs, who has an amazing position at Beale and felt the same way as I did. And we're like, well, why don't we do something about it? And so we started a business and we bought a building and we set up a business and there are four layers to the business. And the first layer is of course, Gilchrist whatnot. Should we go down this path now? Yeah, we should, absolutely. Yeah, yeah was, that's next up. Tell us, tell us about the inspiration for, for the, uh, the, the, the store yeah. doesn't sound right. The, so cool. the environment you've created, how yeah. about that? So, um, I reintroduced myself to Yuba County in 2013 when I purchased my mother's property in the foothills. And from 2013 until 2018, I was using the property for my weekend getaway. And um, then I, um, while I traveled up here from San Francisco every weekend, I got to know the merchants and bought fun antiques and food from Save Mart, my cousin's store, and learned about customer service. Everyone here is so friendly and the pace is much slower. And, and, and I knew, okay, this is great. This is great. And one of the merchants is Demona Dibble. And I bought a lot of stuff from her shop and I confided in her. I said, it, it digs in digs on D street, you bet. which by the way, I've known her since 1980. She actually came yeah. to my apartment. She was like, you're right. You're she, you know, in 1980, my apartment was $400 a month rent. It wow. was in the district, though, and that was astronomical in those days. She was already here from Texas. I didn't realize she'd come that long ago. Wow. She came down with me with Jeff Monden, and they came in. They hung on my apartment for the weekend in San Francisco. Huh. Well, Jeff Bango, he was, you know, they were supposed to be working. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so. So Demona, I came to Demona and said, do you know of a building that's not on D Street that I can move into to start my office and, and my little empire? I use the word empire because that's what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm building my empire. And, um, and I want to do it in my hometown. And I'm not going to set a limit. It's going to be whatever, whatever can happen in every level. If I want a furniture manufacturing company here, let's do that. You know, it will happen eventually. Um, with the cost of California, this is an amazing value. Um, Yuba County in general, it's extraordinary and it's time we win, okay? At any rate, I thought, let's find, and so she, int Demona introduced me to this Neva Bright who came down out of the mountain to meet me from Grass Valley. <laughs> and, and Stuart, let me, let, me, let me interrupt you just for a moment. You're seeing a couple of images inside. Oh, uh, yeah, there's you. Yeah. Whatnot, so. 
who would not want to go into a space like this? To I, I actually trim the bushes now so you can get through. The shrubbery has been... <laughs> Yeah, Banzai, yeah, just a beautiful space you've created. And, you know, places like that can sometimes, I think, be intimidating. Yours is so open and, yeah. and well lit and inviting and just beautiful. And there's all price points. You can you walk in there and find something to meet your budget. And, and it's just an absolutely gorgeous, unique space. I see things that are gone because they've sold, and that makes me sad. <laughs> that, I know, I hate to let go, right? Well, I only buy the sale off. And it's, you know, just, a, and that's just part one of, as Stuart is describing here, of the space. So go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. So I bought, so I, so I met Neva Bright and she had had this building since 1988 and she had vision for the community as well. And, and yet she lost her vision and, and she basically showed me the building and wanted me to go downstairs. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. And there was no electricity and going downstairs freaked me out. And I'm like, I can't deal with this, but I'll take the building. The rent for the building was the exact same amount as my parking space in San Francisco. How could I say no? No, you don't understand. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then and then we moved in. I moved into the first floor, and we agreed to take the second floor when the kids upstairs, who I love, were too, you know, they had a baby and they had to move. Kathy Childers and her beautiful family embraced me into the family immediately. Um, everyone in Marysville has who focus on Marysville to Silver Dollar, et cetera. Anyway, immediately. And so I got the building. Kelvin and I decided instead of deducting rent for repairs, we would just buy the building. And the family was thrilled. And David Anderson handled the transaction, who was my mother's attorney. Thank goodness he's still in practice. Uh, good friend and former, uh, and former head of the Yuba Stutter Arts Council. So. Always hire the finest specialist. Always. Never don't. Always find, hire the finest. If you're doing anything, hire the finest. Um, that way it will endure and survive and last. So so I've learned. Um, and so I... Um, we bought the building and we transformed the lower level hell hole in because we found power and it's like this building this basement is magical and sue moyer was the one who knocked on the door and said do you realize what you have and i'm like sue you're just filled with surprise <laughs> and so we transformed it into neva's place oh. and i think that i could retire now i mean that that's no, i'm not going to i'm kidding but being in that space fills me. So we have music going on down there and specialty cocktails and fundraisers. And, you know, it's all private and quiet and terribly, you know, we have lots of insurance and it takes a lot to put in an event together. But it's imperative people understand that Glamour and Style was in Marysville and it's going to be back. And it already is. And it, it, it's exhausting, but it's yeah, fun. No, but it's such it's such a unique space. And for those who yeah. may not have enjoyed the Nevis Place experience, do watch watch Stewart's uh, Facebook page for announcements about yeah. upcoming public events. You do private events there as well, but but yeah. when you have the option to jump yeah. in there and grab a ticket for something with live music and the cocktails, it's a magical space. You'll be transformed to a different time and place. So. We love it. Absolutely it's love very it. Very exciting. Um, I never thought that I would have done this, actually. I never, ever would have thought I would have returned to Marysville. Um, and, and I am so grateful. I did every day I run into someone that I knew as a kid. Um, and I just, every day is like a gift. It's, yeah. uh, it's phenomenal. So, I, Well, we're, you know, I didn't know you back then, but I'm sure glad I know you now and you've become a great friend of you have a set of arts and culture. Let's talk about a couple of the projects we've been yeah. we've been working on, and then some of the other things you've been doing for the city of Marysville and and the whole community. Um, we uh, I know we talked. Gosh, it's been at least a year ago, if not a little bit more, about a grant we got from the California State Library uh, to help us um, help preserve working with our Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, preserve uh, some of the uh, Japanese American history here, particularly during World War II. Part of the grant covers uh, a creation of a memorial site 
out in Arboga, and you know this history much better than I do, but it had been a uh, migrant farm workers camp in the 30s. It's out on Broadway, and it's um, uh, during the uh, uh, right after the uh, the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor, it became a temporary, what's called an assembly center, and there were a number of these. So while the internment camps were being built around the country, Japanese Americans were immediately rounded up, taken to these temporary facilities like the one in Arboga. And for several months, in our case, we had 2,500 Japanese Americans kind of living in a barracks-like environment, you know, sort of cardboard shacks, uh, lean-tos that were put up, um, and they were housed there. Um, and so that it's a pretty sacred site. So this grant gave us the money to, we're not building a bunch of buildings. This is not like you're going to walk into a museum. But we went to Stewart and Tina Linville to kind of give us some direction. And, and Stewart, um, you know, began to sketch. <laughs> and, and the magic, you know, started to appear from the page. Um, and and the, the concept here, the, the land is today owned by the Marysville Joint Unified School District. Um, they've got many acres there for the future, very future development of a high school or other school properties. And it's going to be a while before that happens. So this could be a movable feast. And, but the concept here is to, is to take, we, we, uh, our memo of understanding allows us to use 200 square feet. Uh, and on this uh, uh, spot, we'll create a, a kind of a walkway, uh, a series of murals, which aren't actually shown in this rendering. Uh, at least not to scale, but um, and at the back of the property, you see the three uh, silhouettes, kind of the outline of the barracks that the folks lived in. These are uh, cord and steel uh, cutouts. Um, there'll be information panels about what went on here, quotations from some of the residents. Uh, at the very back right corner, there will be a mural indication of the, the watchtowers were there, lots of barbed wire. So a bit of an oppressive, you know, feeling. So folks get the, the sense of what occurred and then you'll come out and there'll be a, an area for quiet reflection. And uh, again, this is all in, in collaboration with the Japanese American Citizens League. Stuart, do you want to expand on, on your approach to this design and what you had in mind? So I used to, school bus went by this property every day for six years and I had no idea that it was an internment camp. I knew that there was an an Arboga Assembly Center, but mom never really went into it. And so every day I would go by this property, a little girl lived in the house to the left of this, I forget her name. The house is gone now uh, because I lived in Arboga and I went to school there from 1973 until I don't remember when, six years really. And so <clears throat> I discovered this in 2014 and did, a, and did a, an album on these images. And so when David asked me, Ah, uh, do you know anything about the Arboga Assembly Center? I showed up five minutes later with an entire album. <laughs> this is what's happening. And um, I hope you don't mind, but I'm taking no. And no, then I'm like, by the way, this is what's gonna happen. And so uh, the oppressive chain link fence, barbed wire fence, we have softened with Tina Linville's inspiration of beautiful Japanese claws that have been tied that represent each family member and you get to the barracks themselves, which is modern court and steel, but each of the three have been laser cut to represent the most important things to these Japanese. The first thing they saw every morning when they woke up was the Sutter Buttes as American citizens. So that'll be cut out of the silhouette. One is the Sutter Buttes, that was their view. The second thing they saw every morning was the fact that they were Americans because they were born and raised in America and they had businesses in America. The third thing was that they were Japanese, uh, to Japanese descent. So what happened, happened. And this is an opportunity to pay homage to what happened. And um, the fact that they were Yuba County residents first, American second, and Japanese third was really important to me. And so that's why we want them to be laser cut yeah, in the two to three buildings instead of having a bunch of them. I just wanted those three. And then the the, um, the tower in the back, that was Abby's suggestion. And that's, you know, it's, it's a tower, which you would have. So it really does create this creepy concentration camp with the chain link fence and the barbed wire. Um, because that's what it was like. And it needs to be uncomfortable 
Plus, it's in a rural area, so I want it to be disked with the dirt clods and the natural weeds. So it looks like it's our boga. So it's a, it's a, a fusion of what's really there and, and what had happened in the most respectful way. Yeah. Thank you for letting me do that. Like, I, I've never steamrolled, that's not true. <laughs> I've never steamrolled over anyone. <laughs> Well, I'm saying, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, you get to a certain point. I can describe an idea and a project. And thanks again to our friend Sue Moyers. We, I, I had been educated a couple of years ago about this. And uh, uh, 10 years ago, they had, or 11 years ago now, they had the initial dedication ceremony when the site was designated a state historic landmark. <clears throat> but they hadn't been able to move forward, really, with anything further. <clears throat> for lack of funding, but this specific California State Library Civil Liberties Grant is for this exact kind of thing. So uh, we're just thrilled to be able to do this and, and work with uh, the JACL yes. uh, to further this project and make it a site that's going to be worth a visit because it'll be an hour well spent. Mm -hmm. The information panels, the portraits, the, the faces of interment that we have that'll be part of this uh, program will be, uh, you know, again, uh, noteworthy. Uh, yeah. And as I was talking to the, uh, the woman we work with, Mary Beth Barber, at the California State Library yesterday, you know, a lot of this had not in the past been taught as part of the curriculum. Right. Uh, yeah. you know, and so this kind of particularly this local history that's just so yeah. invaluable. And I think it makes it so much more real and, you know, tangible, I think, for young people. And to your point, the idea that the irony that you had driven by there as a child for six years in your school bus, and now look what you're going to do. We did learn about Japan in school. Um, I learned at Walter Kainak School in Mrs. Ike's classroom. We learned about Japan's modern recovery. Yeah. That's what we were taught. Yeah. And, and so that's what we were taught. We weren't taught about anything but its modern recovery. Yeah. No, I, uh, fascinating. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Better take it off the I can carry on. <laughs> you can. Well, you, may, you may need to. And I'll, I'll turn, it oh, over to you. turn the mic over to you. Let me cue you up, and then uh, we'll get where you go. I'll have what he's having. <laughs> and I have plenty of it. Oh, yeah. And that way, that's a beautiful uh, yeah. hammered uh, pewter picture. I love it. Is that, is that available at Gilchrist Whatnot? It's a, well, this last one may be still available. I think, it, yeah, it is. I, I think it just raised the price. So let's uh, let's talk about the uh, we'll call it the Cotton Roster Memorial Park bronze <laughs> statue project. Um, uh, Stuart invited me into a meeting uh, oh sometime six or eight months ago. Uh, and this project, we should say, in interest of full disclosure, is is uh, you know on the on the horizon. It's not something imminent. Yeah. Uh, but it's out there and it's been discussed. Meetings have been held. But the whole the whole idea is to is to begin some kind of a an homage to Mr. Rosser and his legacy and everything that he's meant to the community over the years. So it started as a well, Stuart, you you've been involved longer in it than I have. So why don't you uh, why don't you take over? I could go on for hours. Please, I mean, please, I, that's a fabulous no, no, no. I, concept I, and everything else. I don't even know where to begin on this. Um, but this is an honor to be involved at all. And I'll tell you, I, I was, it was this pro, the opportunity to do this in this part was brought to my attention by one of the most annoying and beloved neighbors of ours. And he got me to look at the site because he started off with, we're going to tear all the trees down and we're going to bulldoze. And I was like, you're going to do what? No, you're not. And that's how he got my attention. <laughs> And I raced over there and said, no, 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 this is what we're going to do. If you want to do that, this is what we should do. And I drew a sketch and I handed it to him. And then two weeks later, I got a call from the panel, the committee. And I met with the committee and I know all of these people. And it was so beautiful. Um, and really, at that time, the thrust was Cotton's family wants to do a great monument for Cotton now while he's with us. And so we want to make sure it's the right thing and in the right place. And, and how do we go about doing that, Stuart? You actually did three parks, so maybe you might be able to help us. And I jumped on it. Um, and I'm going to refrain from sharing my, my, um, my commitment to this family and what they've meant to me my entire life. Because um, <laughs> I think they've given all of us um, 
so much inspiration. And so I happen to know this family very well. I was very lucky. Um, one of Cotton's, Joanne Rosser, she was my second business client. She hired me to do her home. So I know the family very well. And, um, and you can't not in this community, actually. And so to be asked to do this in my own neighborhood, so I, I bow down to everyone who asked. And where we are now is just making sure that it is so much the family, but the family is struggling with dealing with no industry at this time. The COVID-19 has shut down all every rodeo and no every rodeos, right like any other big public event the rockers are you know scurrying to feed cattle and and get all of the cattle fell fed all over the country you know the rosser brand is is america and um so 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 we're, we're you know we're on hold until we can focus on actually really being able to focus on this and so um, all of the elements you see there, there are seven different options and we honed it in. And the city of Marysville was able to really isolate the property where it will go. And we know when, when it's time, it will be time. When the right time is the right time. And, and can you describe that site? So the site is Plaza Park. It's a mini park. It's a part of our mini park plans. Big, long story, I'll spare you. But um, <clears throat> it used to be the on-ramp and the off-ramp to the old D Street Bridge from E Street. And it's all still there, but it's been, you know, gracefully you turned into a park, which we call Plaza Park. And it's where the stampede ends on D Street from Yuba City. It comes down D and turns to go to the Cotton Arena, the Cotton Rosser Arena, which is in Beckworth Park, right around the corner. And so this this is this is Cotton facing D Street in Plaza Park. Plaza Park was where everyone arrived when they came to Marysville off of the steamships. It was where everyone arrived when Cotton arrived in the 50s down D Street Bridge. And now everyone arrives on E Street. So it's right there in the center and I wanted Cotton to be front and center. So it's it's just to the right of the, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, pagoda uh, and to the right of uh, Silver Dollar Saloon and that nice grassy area there. And yes. Beautiful setting, so. Yeah. Well, we're excited. We've met with uh, bronze sculptors and some amazing artists. So when uh, when things get a little more stable, then we can look for some grant funding and try to find some local funding if there's any left <laughs> yes. as everyone recovers. So we're, we're not naive to the uh, economic circumstances today. So. Yeah. And all of those details, we didn't just pick something out of the sky. They're, they relate to the Rosser family. Every element, every aspect has to have something to do with reality in the design. Mm -hmm. We haven't well, had a chance to have a conversation with the Rossers because, <clears throat> you know, Reno is basically Uber driving cattle all over the country, like an Uber driver for cows. That's what he's doing. Wow. Seriously. So he has yeah. time to look at this. Busy time. So we could spend an hour talking about what went into the design of that, uh, yeah. that memorial site, but we'll, uh, We'll, we'll get into that uh, on a future yeah. program. Let's, uh, let's touch on uh, some of the other things you've done for Marysville. Um, the Parks Project, even though the grants were not funded, last year you spent a tremendous amount of time. We provided, we, Yuba Sutter Arts, provided some input on some, some of the artistic elements, but then you created these grand visions of like what you did for Veterans Park, um, these beautiful renderings that, uh, that helped to really illustrate the, uh, the grant narrative that the consultants sent in on our behalf. Yeah, no, I jumped in banging on the door. Jim Bermudez was, you know, in, in that seat at the time. And I said, I'm getting involved. And, 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 and that's that. <laughs> and Veterans Park is the one at fifth and. This was traditionally um, called Napoleon Park. And it's one of the original design parks in the city of Marysville uh, designed, you know, by a Frenchman. And uh, when Marysville was actually going to be twice the size. Mm. And so it's now Veterans Park. And all of these, this is a, you know, this is the, the environmental designer. And I forget their names. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I know. They were great to work with. They said, Stuart, you can move palm trees. So this was, and I didn't know you could move palm trees. So I took all the random palm trees that are there that um, uh, uh, um, um, Gertrude Cable petitioned 
to have planted in all of the parks. Um, we moved the palm trees and we were able to really redo the landscape and respect the traditional, you know, crisscross layout and bring desperately needed amphitheater and gazebo and children's play area and re-respect the Veterans Park and create an entrance, which is the cord and steel raised platforms on either side. And also a way of having vendors on Fifth Street. So when we start our hot August night cruises on our new Fifth Street project, the 4A plan, which was something else I worked aggressively on with the city, we have an, an, a, an avenue, a promenade for people to be proud of and parade on that is not a state highway because we don't have one. And so it will be Fifth Street, which is tied to the Twin Cities Memorial Bridge, which if you haven't been on, it is amazing, exactly as the designers envisioned. And so the Fifth Street corridor will follow that beautiful promenade all the way over to E. Eventually we're gonna have a bypass. I can't wait to talk about that. Hmm. Off the last ring, but I'm getting ahead. And uh, it's all right, too. it's all right. I am. And, and then uh, there's that great overview uh, rendering you did of, um, I think it ties into the uh, B Street uh, project, the hotel project. So uh, that, that well, property. That's that was a fanciful sketch of what could happen in paradise, and that was for a friend who was looking at a position there. And and you know, again, there are more directives in this. This is a possibility of modern architecture and mixture and what have you. But really, the city needs to determine what is the look of the city at this time and how close do they want housing. And so this was just a sketch to show something. Um, and I did that in an hour for one of one of my friends. I'm um, sorry, I missed, so I misintroduced yeah, that's it. That's called Paradise, and that's actually the new downtown Paradise area, and I just extended it from there. And I didn't want to take away from there. I mean, this is the first rendering that the city of Paradise has done showing the residents the new Paradise. And so I just expanded off of that because I didn't want to take away from that. Got it. I, I'm sorry, I mis misintroduced that, but but you've also been involved with the B Street Hotel project. Yes. Well, yeah. just in participating in council. Okay. I go, I show up, I listen, and then I sketch. And they've got a consultant that's actually come in, and there have been two sets of consultants in the past two years to give feasibility studies. Okay. And Phase, the second wave of the feasibility study was the hotel, which we all knew would be successful. And all of that is a matter of public record. It was presented in last week's council, um, booting a luxury hotel in Marysville. And, you know, I can define that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> the hotel that really, that we want to stay in and be proud of sure. is ideal in the triad area with the ballpark and the lake and the train station and the Achapeni lawns of properties and all of that. And I, you know, again, it's all beautifully connected and it took me about 30 minutes to draw with the parking structures and the pedestrian crossing for the ACE train. Easy right. breathing. And all, all those assets are there. I mean, it's just, uh, it's so incredible, you know, to finally bring it to life. So. Right. Uh, and when you can actually put together a cohesive plan that connects everything together, investors are like, and I love the rendering. So where do I sign up? Not like, hmm, maybe, no, there's no maybe. This is Marysville. Good, good, good. And and most recently, I think perhaps you've gotten involved in the Smartsville Church Project. Oh, we followed, you know, Kit Burton and his whole team and what they've been doing up there for years and years and years. So tell us about that. It's a, such a beautiful building. And mm -hmm. Oh, I can't say enough. Um, we've got a picture of it there somewhere. This is a picture somewhere. So um, <clears throat> this is um, one of, so this was the, this was what the church used to look like. And um, in, in one of the eras that uh, will be reproduced. And I'm, in a nutshell, this project has been going on for, I believe, 20 years. And it is- Yeah, at least. Right? And, and so, you know, the Burtons were the first I met and you know, I, I can't say enough. And it's a joy to be around them, period. But to be able to assist them mm, and fill in the blanks. And um, this is another dream come true. And so Kelvin Scruggs, um, my business partner, and I came up with an amazing um, 
plan for the next phase, and we're in the works now of doing it, and there is a rendering of it. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. You're going to have to wait. And you can also, you know, get involved by donating and helping volunteer. But volunteer is hard work, by the way. It's not just, you know, anyway, I won't go any further. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important. I want to bring the 21st century to Yuba County. Um, and because I've dabbled in it effortlessly and it has made my life m so much richer and the, the opportunity available to our children by embracing this is key. And, you know, we tie this in with what Lon Hotamia has done with, with the, you know, with the study for the Yuba County Economic Strategic Plan, which was launched December 10th and then relaunched 2.0. July 23rd, the county supervisors unanimously approved moving forward. We have education center coming in. We have a lot of extremely amazing opportunities. Oh, yeah. And um, we, we need to embrace situations like this. You will never know that this isn't an 1879 church until you're in it, and then something is going to happen. And I am so excited about this, and that's all I can tell you. Do we, do we have the, uh, the rendering we can show that Stuart had done? Sketch with little things leaning, like see how the yeah. paint is leaning forward. Oh, so that's that's the oh, that's the other rendering of the boga. No, I thought I sent it over, but maybe I no. Well, there is a rendering, but look, that's all right. We'll look forward to seeing that. I've got it in the files and didn't get it to our engineer. All right, wow, we've covered some ground, huh? Coast yeah. to coast and back yeah. again, and here we are in Marysville. Yeah. By the way, what is the temperature today, Mary? Is it 102 yet? Is it getting there? Yeah. <laughs> Dazzling urban. I'm sweating like a farm animal. <laughs> Woo! Well, you know, yeah. Uh, and all of that stuff really messed, coronavirus really messed up with every everything. So, yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's quicken the pace here. Go off in a little different direction. We've covered a great deal of your life and career and and your current projects and golly onward and upward Stuart. And we can't thank you enough for being here and for your passion for the community. So um, as we like to do each week, we uh, take inspiration from our friend, James Lipton, who um, ran the actor studio in New York for many years. And we asked uh, our guest the 10 questions he asked all of the artists he interviewed on his inside the actor studio program. So we'll start with this one. What is your favorite word? Refinements. Oh. Yeah. What's your uh, least favorite word? Any soundbite, any corporate jargon term, don't want to ever hear it. No. God, you're so easy. <laughs> what uh, What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Anything unexpected, any color burst, anyone or anything that comes up with a fresh, classic, refreshing burst of color. So you like a little bit of spontaneity? Absolutely. What uh, what turns you off creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? The exact opposite. Anything expected and expected color. Anything beige. That is not a color. I'm not. You're never coming to my house. Well, you know I mean. I, I know. I know. Choice. I mean that's a beige. Beige. Figuratively. No, I, I got it. I got it. Hey, I have another. Ver no, I would still. You know. Color. You, know how many, you know how many gallons of Navajo white I painted as a young man as a painting contractor? <laughs> Mom, I have eight properties here, believe me. I don't think we use Navajo white. Mom, what did we use? They're it probably was, stuck in my fingernails still. It was the go-to in LA. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was, the orange paint, it was always ready. Right. What, uh, what is your favorite curse word? I borrowed my mother's, can we say this in public? It's three of them, and it's put together always, and it's when she's sewing and a pin hits her finger. Oh, oh. It's shit piss. <laughs> yeah. Right out, of, right out of George Carlin, seven words you can't say on TV. I get it all the time. <laughs> Love you, Mom. Yeah, My mother was a seamstress as well, and I can I can almost feel that needle hitting oh, the yeah. bone. Oh, I built cities under her pattern making world. So. Right. Oh, my see. mother. Oh my God. The scraps, paper. Yeah, we'll talk about that offline. What yeah. uh, what sound or noise do you love? The cello. Any sort of musical instrument that's being played innocently by someone who's not paying attention or you know in their own zone. So the well, cello, musical instrument. 
in a, in a, in a beautiful room, like mm. the National Gallery of Art, the the dome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, in Washington D.C. It's a beautiful. Been there, room. been there, done that. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. The, the dome of the National Gallery. Anytime they have a quartet or anything. I love those museum concerts. Right. You know, there's something about that that coupling. I mean, I love a good concert hall too, but yeah. Oh. It's Good called, memories. Do they call it the rotunda or the dome? I think they call it the rotunda. I, rotunda is what I'm what I'm recalling. Yeah. yeah. You think of me and Marcus for lunch when I hear rotunda, and I don't want to do that. It's just, yeah, I know. What uh, what sound or noise do you hate? Leaf blowers. Oh. And I use one, but guilty, I guilty. <laughs> I hate leaf. <laughs> I know they're a, they're a mixed blessing. I you know I was fascinated to see the protesters in Portland, however, repurposing leaf blowers to blow away the uh, the tear gas. Yeah, I I don't want to be in a protest ever. I don't like men. Well, I know, but I, I thought that was if you got to be there, that's one way to counteract the the tear gas. I lived in Hollywood for fourteen years, and that's where I learned about. That's when I discovered noise and noise abatement. Oh yeah. And I thought, what's what is the worst? The helicopters in the middle of the night or the leaf blowers? And the helicopters brought entertainment because you just right. turn on the TV to see who was doing what. You were right. to get caught. Sorry. Uh, run. Infrared. Hello. <laughs> um, so the leaf blower is is definitely. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Can't disagree with you. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Litigation, law. Law. Hmm. Ah, you're the second one. That's that was my answer too. It just okay. opens up. Yeah. Law degree just opens countless doors. Prosecution, not defense. What, that kind. I don't know what. What profession would you not like to pursue? The medical profession. Mm. Yeah. I get physically ill when I see needles. <laughs> Particularly going into fingers. Oh no, different, different. <laughs> Well, I had, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> no, let's, yeah, I just don't like needles of any kind ever, ever, okay? <laughs> right. I'm on it. Spotting, I'm on it. I did not care for train spotting. N needles? Oh, I'm no. Not. Like, Ooh. no. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, but no thanks. But I can't be in the medical profession because I just can't deal with the needles. And I love all of the medical profession, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Gotta hand it to you, I don't know how you do it. Oh, <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Last but not least, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? It does exist, and it is what we make of it, and it is what it is to us. And what I will hear is, what took you so long? <laughs> well played. Well played. My friend, Stuart, always a joy to talk with you. It's been just divine. We need another couple of hours, but we'll get back. Well, let's get some work done, and then, yeah. you know, because we're on hold now, we're designing. Well, which, I, you can see I have piles and piles of stuff. Um, oh, I won't even show you my piles, but it's uh, yeah, it's time to get back out, survey the uh, our bogus site, and start uh, planning to dig up some dirt. Yeah, coming Great. soon. Well, that yeah. wraps it up for this week's uh, artist alchemy. Uh, thanks to our technical support team, our producer Abby Sassina, technical director Alex Sassina. Next week, August 4th, on Artist Alchemy, our special guest will be James Gilbreth. He's the Yuba College Professor of Theater Arts, great director. He's built a great program there, 4 p.m., right here on Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture's Facebook page. Until next time, that's it for Artist Alchemy. And don't forget all the other great Yuba Sutter Arts uh, virtual events coming up on Facebook. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you, Stuart.